We must speak the truth about terror. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories, malicious lies that attempt to shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves. What happens? I tell you what happens. Blam! I have a window that looks directly at the World Trade Center, and I saw... No collusion! Shit's getting way too complicated for me. Welcome to The Antidote. This is Greg McCarran. And this is Jeremy Roth Show. Right now we are recording. It is Saturday night, December 5th. and um, Last last show we did, um, we discussed, we looked at the the trajectory and the terrain of some pretty what we saw at the time, and we still do see at the time some pretty ominous um, developments in terms of a complete shakeup of the Department of Defense, where you had the re, the re, uh, the the removal of uh, Defense Secretary Mark Esper, which resulted in the um, bringing in of um, combination of Cash Patel, the hardline anti-Muslim crusader, and then the obviously Ezra Cohen Watnick, the almost seems like right hand man of some semblance, some form or another of uh, the now recently pardoned uh, General General Michael Flynn. And we talked about um, in terms of a potential scenario with, say, even a President Donald Trump not leaving office or whatever that may or may not um, result in. We talked about what we described as a triumvirate of what we labeled as a triumvirate of treason and it was a combination of american domestic interest in terms of a combination of the you know council for national policy and all of its um all of its interconnecting uh, networks and operatives and and operations going on and then the two two-sided foreign centric um one two punch of uh israeli zionist interest and more Russian centric interests. And perhaps I was a little simplistic on the foreign policy front. There's some other players that we may, you know, we may or may not have real, uh, strong grip or semblance on. But I feel like that was a, from at least from like the far, the long term, short term and long term, uh, right wing operation, so to speak, in terms of how the right wing power structures operated in this country. And my belief that, um, more and more we're seeing like the Republican party just become a complete, um, a complete, um, operator on behalf of this very strong foreign centric um, activity going on in this country in terms and we'll talk more about that I think when uh, in the very near future based on um, a phone call that I made into uh, C-SPAN earlier this week where I laid out my theory of the uh, of the Republican Party, the GOP basically becoming a foreign owned uh, entity is what I is how I describe the phone call into into C-SPAN, but in our last show we talked about. But will you d- describe that a little bit in terms of the information okay, sure. that you that you put out uh, on right. C-SPAN in relationship to that? Okay, so Monday morning I uh, called into C-SPAN's Washington Journal, and the the topic during the open line portion of the program was um, what is I, I'm paraphrasing; I don't have the exact uh, topic in front of me. What is uh, Donald Trump? Uh, basically, Donald Trump's uh, what is Donald Trump's legacy in terms of how Donald Trump has affected the Republican Party and the GOP. And my response was, well, Donald Trump is, uh, has been the finalization of the finalizing of the Republican Party, the GOP becoming a completely foreign owned entity. And I laid, I mentioned, uh, four, four bullet points I focused on in this phone call. One was, um, Donald Trump is the, as a long term going back at least to the 1980s, rush, uh, Asset, if not outright agent of, uh, of Russian interests, Russian, you know, compromise operations. And then I mentioned secondly, the long-term Council for National Policy, uh, agenda of basically moving the conservative movement in America closer to, closer to Russia in terms of, uh, culture wars and other aspects. And I'm, I specifically mentioned, uh, the old, the late, uh, conservative activist, uh, Paul Weyrich and the Heritage Foundation and really at the forefront of cultivating that relationship going back to the 1980s and on now into uh, 2020 under the guise of the, of the cold war uh, era hostilities with the Soviet union as the evil empire and going on from there. And then thirdly, I mentioned the, the very, the Israeli centric aspect of this operation, which I think more than anything else was epitomized by Breitbart made in America conceived in Israel 
with all of the Mercer money and all that that operation um, entails. And then finally, I mentioned the insertion of foreign money into our American uh, political system and particularly into the um, campaign coffers of Republican leading GOP politicians such as Mitch McConnell, House Leader Kevin McCarthy, and Senator Lindsey Graham, three people in particular who were not initially um, really down with the uh, Trump agenda, so to speak. But then um, I think you could make a strong case as a result of um, you know foreign influence, whether it's Oleg Deripaska ro- pouring money into uh, the state of Kentucky in terms of uh, – uh, I believe aluminum plants in Kentucky and other business endeavors that would benefit uh, Senator Mitch McConnell, as well as Senator Rand Paul, who I think longer term has more been in uh, has more been in um, league with this uh, what I'm calling this ongoing uh, operation. So, speak, but definitely Mitch McConnell, as you well could as call it a ma- mafia libertarianism. There you go. There you go. And it fits right in with their whole like business uh, business uh, business is everything um, economic uh, philosophy as well. So you got McConnell and then Lindsey Graham with uh, whatever went on with that strange meeting at that golf course and Lindsey Graham's uh, fealty that went on with Trump afterwards. And there's a there is a uh, there is a there is a money trail of there's a trail of money from, uh, I believe, from uh, Deripaska interest as well as uh, interest related to Mr. Leonard Blavatnik. And then finally, Kevin McCarthy, the House leader, who went from saying that, uh, if uh, you know Vladimir Putin owns Donald Trump and Dana Rohrabacher back in 2016 to being a complete uh, subservient, a uh, uh, sycophant of all things, of all things, uh, Trump agenda. So those were the four la- the four pillars I laid out in this uh, phone call into uh, into C-SPAN on Monday morning. I feel like that was a follow up on like the what we talked about in terms of the triumvirate of treason, trying to bring in a long term and current perspective on what I call the complete um, transformation of the Republican Party, the GOP, into what I described in this phone call as a foreign-owned entity. And I believe that is a – I believe that is a nat, uh, a strong um, – a relevant follow-up to our conversation we had on what we labeled the triumvirate of treason and trying to figure out like the forces in terms of the – of this – post-election chaos that we're we're bringing about perhaps a very dangerous moment and still a moment that i think is dangerous but that we perhaps have not changed our perspective on but have somewhat you know altered and evolved our perspective on based on the last few weeks of uh, activity that's taken place since we last recorded yes i would say if if um if i were usain bolt um the uh, runner i would say that call was devastating and uh, I, I think it was, you know, you, it was unique in in relationship to the whole time of the Trump years. I believe that it was like the first time that that whole package, the range of those facts and those figures, uh, were connected in that in answering the que- this question that was on the table uh, for that morning show. And so I uh, applaud you for it. It was a great call, Greg. And we're gonna work to actually Thank play you. it on a future show. Um, so people can hear it. And also, I think it's a very good example of that kind of, you know, of public information activism in a really raw way, uh, and a very effective way. And, you know, it, it implicates the GOP, but it also implicates C-SPAN to some extent too, in relationship to how little they've actually featured the kind of voices that could have, uh, you know, ought, they could have featured authors who could have, put some of these pieces on the table and to a large extent they did not and as we've always pointed out we still appreciate that it's it's one of the few you know public access you know mass public fora available to the american people to both understand what you know across the spectrum what different people are thinking and feeling about things but also to get your voice out there on key issues and you can also you know you can either call in during the open phones as you did, which really gives you the open space to answer the question in your own way. Or you can also call in when there's like figures on there that you want to ask a question, confront that kind of thing. I think you're right because um, there could be some very, very serious um, analysts 
and um, people who have done some very serious research in the long term trajectory of the right wing conservative movement in this country, as well as the very real foreign and as laid out by people such as Seth Abramson global operation in terms of uh, the installation of uh, Donald Trump as our president. And, you know, maybe C-SPAN could feature more of those people rather than pussyfooting around with the likes of Ken Blackwell and uh, Tom Fitton in the future. But I'm not saying they will, but that would be like, you know, if the, the C-SPAN were like a serious um, purveyor of truth in this generation. Although I do, I do second your, um, your, your assessment that uh, you know, C-SPAN does provide a great service, and one way it does is that it gives us gives you more of a perspective on what actual Americans feel and believe about the issues of our time than you get pretty much in any other, I would say, mainstream uh, political quote news oriented media per se. But you know, there's still the glaring problem of C-SPAN has not been an accurate or um, anywhere near an adequate purveyor of actual serious. Um, what would pass for truth in this in this current moment and pretty much since its uh, conception with the uh, rise of uh, the rise of uh, cable television to a mass audience. Yes. And, you know, I mean, you also like pointed out to me how it's also very rich resource in terms of their entire um, archives of all of the videos that are there where it's one of the few places you can find like the raw footage of the think tanks talking to each other, you know, like for example, even that, that infamous Patrick, Patrick Clausen, Winnep, uh, you know, how are we going to get an American president to war with Iran during Obama with Dennis Ross sitting on that same panel and, um, and maybe, uh, I don't know. I can't remember who the president of Winnep is. That comes out of C-SPAN covering it, and it's all on the archives there. And you know, people like even like people like who docu do documentaries about neocons, like like Robbie Martin. You know, the, a strong piece of you know a large portion of the raw footage to create documentaries like that comes from C-SPAN. So you know, we we are uh, critic. Cri we have critical applause. For uh, C-SPAN, and uh, but most importantly, we would encourage folks to uh, use C-SPAN, both the airwaves, the archives, all of that. So, oh, and Greg, let's dip, let's dip back into Blavatnik really quickly because I think he's a, a a crucial figure in the the potential close of the Trump era. And although maybe we should talk a little bit more, we'll continue to dig a little bit deeper into the moment what's still the threats going on right now in terms of you know and if, all the generals calling for mass sedition and martial law and the overthrow of the regular format of the u.s government and all of that uh that's still you know it's being talked about in public and at the very least you know uh you can go uh john brisson has been doing some programs about this which is very interesting playing clips and uh assessing it and, you know, one of the things that we talk about is like how, Greg, you and me, where we do have a certain, maybe an attachment, but a focus on rules and norms, that rules and norms are not just important to be for themselves, you know, just as just as form, per se, but they also are related to the possibility of the question of creating or resurrecting the concept of rule of law uh, at some level. And so there is a sort of chaos, there's a chaos warfare, a destabilization operation that goes on just by the utterance of these high level, you know, Thomas McInerney's, Michael Flynn types, hey, Michael Flynn, head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, formerly. I think it's the biggest intelligence uh, agency in the U.S. government, I believe, actually, I'm almost positive, McInerney. Number three, high level U.S. Air Force up to number three, part of crew, you know, key operations, Lib bombing Libya in the 80s, right? You know, serious stuff going on. And these guys are, you know, th there's a whole parallel uh, reality going on uh, where everything has been uh, flipped upside down. And the, you know, as we begin to pick up on, as Alex Jones began to, Re, he turned his, you know, he, he had a change of heart on his research about garden plot and the 
Rex 84 and all of the Oliver North crew and the question of planning for continuity of government and, you know, with, with a planning for being able to put Americans into camps and all of that and we're in quote unquote worst case scenarios. And then halfway through the Trump regime, first four years, maybe last four years, uh, it had a change of heart and was like, no, this is, I, I misunderstood this the whole time. This was, you know, this was, this was the anti-communist, the anti-globalist who were trying to art, you know, architect a way to be able to deal with, you know, if the Chinese were to one of these days to cross the real grand, like, uh, like Project Veritas founder with a, you know, and it attacked the United States. Like I've been threatening for every single you know, year <laughs> for years. <laughs> it's very similar to Alex's, uh, Oh, his misunderstanding on uh, September 11th and, um, until, uh, David Horowitz, uh, educated him on what, oh, well, September 11th really, it wasn't an, it wasn't an effort to frame Muslims for an attack on America to start a perpetual never ending, uh, series of, uh, never ending war on terror. No, it was actually the radical Muslims working with the liberals in the West to destroy America. And the, and the, is there really any difference between the liberals and the communists? Really? No. Come on. And the, what demon we call the and, Mecca Mecha alliance. And, and in the Trump era, the, the, uh, liberals and the communists have now been put into the monolithic conspiracy of the demon rats, right? Although the people, all those we're seeing with this most recent, uh, uproar over, um, over prominent Republicans, uh, criticizing, uh, the super patriot MAGA attorney, uh, Lynn Wood down in Georgia for saying Republicans shouldn't vote in the Georgia primary. Then you can very quickly see, uh, even, you know, the Newt Gingriches in the bright parts of the world become, uh, demon rat enablers, even though they've done everything in their power to, uh, obviously be the leading way in terms of like, you know, defending and shilling for all things Trump. So it, you know, that's a, that's a bit of a, that's a bit of a digression, but it, it fits into this whole narrative of like where anybody who is like seen as a, uh, is seen as even slightly opposed to like dear cult leader, chairman, daddy Trump in any way, shape or form becomes like a demon rat enabler. But well, let's, 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 will you put on the table the, that's that story of Blavatnik? Yes, I in will. 2019. It's from 2019, right? Yes, because, um, I was, uh, I was alerted to this. Um, I was listening to the, uh, Sarah Kenzie on the podcast, um, Gaslit Nation, which, um, you know, our listeners, I'm sure a lot of our listeners would not agree with um, everything stated on, on that program. But uh, in terms of their pl- their own personal political um, ideologies and their worldviews. But it's been a very, I would say, Gaslit Nation, Sarah Kinsier in particular, along with the co-host, uh, Andrea Chalupa, has been an extremely valuable and I believe prescient observer of the current situation and just the dangers of like particularly this Trump operation actually poses dom- domestically as well as globally the domestic threat i think that really becomes out of uh out of this. so i think that that podcast i'd recommend for people is a uh, as a great source of like a, a prescient analysis of like the actual dangers of the moment we're facing from a i would say from a bigger picture perspective in terms of like actual things that we could only imagine coming to America in the past actually becoming a reality. The things that you only hear about, like in the worst of, uh, you know, third world banana republics, so to speak. And so anyway, I was alerted to this that, um, I knew we, we had touched on, um, we had touched on the article, the work that came out of, uh, from the, uh, from the website Bellingcat in October of, uh, of 2019. U.S. politicians can't stop taking Len Blavatnik's money, which is a deep dive by, by the way, the journalist title, the, Author of this article is a journalist by the name of Casey Michael, M I C H E L is his last name. It might be Michelle. I'm, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right. But anyway, his uh, Twitter handle is at CJC. I'm going to say Michelle here. Um, Casey that's Michelle. Right, yeah. Anyway, um, this article from October 2019, and we've touched on it here, and I believe we touched on a I believe we touched on an Allison Weir article, which I kind of followed up on this information about Blavatnik actually from. Uh, the great, the great activist, uh, Allison Weir, and we can look back through and provide the uh, links to these articles in our show notes that we'll bring, that we'll place and post when we, uh, com- when we post this program onto our platforms. But anyway, this article gets, it's a very in-depth article of, uh, 
financial um, contributions from uh, Leonard Blavatnik to both Republicans and Democrats. On one hand, Kevin McCarthy's Victory Fund is mentioned, but at the same time, uh, many many donations to uh, leading to leading Democrats is mentioned. Uh, particularly mentions a one hundred and twenty four thousand two hundred and fifty dollar donation that was given from uh, Blavatnik and his wife Emily to the Democratic. Congressional Campaign Committee, DCCC. Not only was it the second largest single donation Blavatnik has ever made to a U.S. politician or committee, but with combined with his wife's donation, it totaled as much as any other individual donation that DCCC has ever received in its entire history. And this becomes very interesting because, as uh, the aforementioned Sarah Kenzie was pointing out in her pod- most recent podcast on Gaslit Nation, uh, there was a serious, very um, – d- Democrats in Congress, led by, uh, it appears, a California Congresswoman Jackie Spire, Spear, Spire. Spear, were, maybe. It's Jackie Spear. Okay. Jackie Spear was, uh, very, was making it, was very vocal about investigating, uh, Leonard Blavatnik's business dealings and, uh, particularly as it relates to, as, um, Leonard Blavatnik in mob activity in, um, in, in some, in many of its actions going on, uh, Domestically and, uh, and globally, in ter- particularly, uh, to tie the investigation into, uh, Stephen Mnuchin, Treasury Secretary, and his ties to Deripaska and Blavatnik, and how really tying back the, um, the, the sudden, um, the sudden, the fact that this investigation never went anywhere, and linking that to, uh, Blavatnik's record-breaking donation to the, uh, Democratic, uh, the DCCC back in uh, June of 2019. So this is something we understood, like the we figured out, like the significance of this article in terms of the Blavatnik donations to uh, both Republicans and Democrats. But I believe this is a piece that we didn't uh, we didn't pick up on particularly at the time was this particular donation coming in as it appeared that there was at least noise of a serious um, inquiry into the activities of uh, Leonard Blavatnik and Oleg Deripaska by prominent uh, Democratic member of the House of Representatives. Yes, and there, there, the article that you mentioned by Allison Weir, which was uh, just a little bit after uh, that article that you referenced, um, it was actually November 24th, 2019, titled World Jewish Congress Billionaires, Oligarchs, Global Influencers for Israel. And she goes through a whole bunch of stuff, activity going on at the World Jewish Congress and uh, and touches on a, a lot of these characters, including um, Blavatnik. And uh, at about the same time as that um, Casey Michelle article that you referenced, there's also a Mother Jones article by Dan Friedman titled, A Soviet-Born Billionaire is Buying Influence at U.S. Institutions. Anti-corruption activists are worried. The Council on Foreign Relations is under fire for accepting Len Blavatnik's gifts thanks to his tie to Russian, to uh, oligarchs and Russian corruption. And, you know, there's a reminder too that Blavatnik is heavily tied in. He he was, he was, uh, named as you know, on the periphery of the Netanyahu corruption investigation, I believe. Um, and he is very tied in to Chabad networks and, uh, and Israel too. And there was, it's interesting, like over the course of the years of the, of the Trump regime, we've, we've continually touched on Blavatnik at different points. We first began to, uh, talk about him in that first year where we were assessing the Mnuchin entrance into uh, Treasury and the sales of Mnuchin's uh, company, Dune, and how how Blavatnik was taking his company's called Access, I think it's called Access Industries, and he's come, you know, for a lot like a lot of these, uh, you know former Soviet sphere oligarchs that we've been tracing and that are so tied in to this 11-9 investigation and Trump, you know, who who facilitated Trump and why. A lot of these networks, they are resource oligarch networks. And so Access Industries is an interesting name. And I'll just uh, reread some from the uh, Wikipedia page about Blavatnik. 
uh, quote in his, in under his career in 1986, Blavatnik founded Access Industries, an international conglomerate company located in New York, of which he is chairman and president. Access has long term holdings in Europe and North and South America. Initially, he moved into Russian investments just after the fall of communism. He and a friend from university, Victor Vexelberg, right, put, you know, star around that name, formed the Renova investment vehicle. And then the two joined with Mikhail Friedman's Alpha Group, put some asterisks around that name, too, in that group, to form the AAR venture, right, Access Alpha Renova, right, Vexelberg. Friedman and uh, Blavatnik. Access has since diversified its portfolio to include investments in industries such as oil, entertainment, coal, aluminum, petrochemicals, and plastics, telecommunications, media, and real estate. Uh, and then also uh, in in relationship with finance. And he's very wealthy. Like they they say, he's the third wealthiest man in the UK. Um, but they say he's worth $26.6 billion. And he, so he bought in to, uh, you know, Hollywood holdings that Mnuchin was on his way out from in order to join, uh, the Trump administration. And so there's the, the he's a key, key figure. And, and, um, so the, and then the, this, another story from that first year that we were looking at when we were investigating, Blavatnik, which is very much related to what you just pointed out about this much more recent turn back to the Democrats to potentially paying off the Democrats politically, really, it looks like, to drop investigations. And there's been lots of stories. You can go research it, but lots of stories about how sensitive he and his PR people are to being talked about in the press in a certain way. They will not grant they grant interviews unless there's a guarantee that he won't be called an oligarch. He's very sensitive about that word. Uh, and, uh, and of course, this relationship with Vexelberg going way back, there's a scene of them on a roof top, I believe, and maybe in New York or something like that, talking about the future. So they're, they're close, you know, and they go way back and they, they come out of these, uh, aluminum wars, uh, which is, you know, there's not a lot of talk of the, you know, deep state, the black economy, the mob aspect here publicly. But this whole net, you know, this is that network that is that there is the global, <laughs> the laundering, there's the intersection, right, of business that is done in a lawful fashion uh, that includes the raping and pillaging of resources, obviously, <laughs> it's legal. Uh, but it's also, as we know from the background of the Mo, the Semyon Mogilevich's and his relationship with Robert Maxwell and Maxwell has having apparently taught Mogilevich the, the global finance appropriate methods to setting up financial instruments that can work to launder vast amounts of money all around the world. Right. And so th- this is the intersection of what we might call the, the Russian sphere deep state. Uh, the connection and, if, you know, to update the what I've been harping on for the, all these Trump years about let's let's, you know, especially during the continuing abuse of the term deep state, let's get the concept proper. Let's not just give it up to uh, QAnon's late adoption of it, late abuse of it. Basically, let's bring it back to what it actually describes and, you know, its legacy in, in uh, you know, thinkers like Peter Dale Scott. But so we should update it to basically say it's the deep state is not only the intersection between the national security apparatus of any sphere or government or na- national government, including, including mainly the covert operations, right? The where intelligence operations that are meant to be off book necessarily push towards uh, financing it off books also, which would include black economy. And then there's very quickly the justifications for then controlling aspects of black economics in terms of drug, drug flows, sex trafficking, and then how that then gets reincorporated, of course, into the 
the usage of the these sort of covert security apparatuses in terms of blackmail um, abilities to move money uh materials material all around the world too so there's that the national there's national security apparatus but then as that whole you know, phrasing suggests in terms of thinking through how covert operations naturally lend itself towards an intersection with with the um under the underbelly of the economy the the criminal uh, organized criminal aspect of the economy then you then deal with that the the global organized crime aspect and and that is so well known even like the from the people like the Noam Chomsky's who like to use all of the chatter around something like the Kennedy assassination to poo poo it be like does it even matter if it was the mafia or a jilted lover you know and so that that the whole surrounding of deep state actions or deep politics events of deep po- deep political events state crimes against democracy state crimes against minds such as these assassinations they're always surround they're bathed in basically and in many ways you could say they're even hung out in a in a, bl- a bad jacketed way a dirtied up way in the realm of the the mafia as chomsky might call it you know and but that is not just a cover that's also the of course you know once you're dealing with high level uh national security executive style actions assassinations false flag terrorism you're dealing with immediately needing to have a a cutout a limited cutout at the same time uh, i mean a uh you know a uh, a cutout where you can have plausible deniability so you have a layer of protection in in terms of your own plausible deniability in, in relationship to a uh an actual government official's role in something like that think of like in an american context obviously someone like james angleton or george h w bush or Dulles in relationship to something like the Kennedy assassination. Um, and then of course, then you bring in the, the mafia and they both supply the, the, you know, the, the many hands make light work aspect of deep state actions, but also the surrounding it with, uh, this is just the criminal underworld. And so I'd I like to add to those two pieces that have been harping on over and over again in terms of national security apparatus, uh, criminal underworld as the, the deep state exists in that, in that, in intersectionality there, that we should then add in the, obviously, this oligarchy, you know, oligarchs, right? And that's why it's so sensitive to someone like, uh, uh, Blavatnik because part, and, and this is the same in an American sphere too, which you see most obviously in relationship to like with the super mob, the Jewish mob, the, you know, the, the few, the few neighborhoods in Chicago, for example, uh, in Gus Russo's book, Super Mob, where, you know, some, uh, Jewish immigrants from the pale and Eastern Europe and Russia come to the United States in the 1800s largely. And you, you can sort of track like the big names that go through, uh, organized crime and that whole 20th century, uh, interesting first half story around the, uh, um, the uh, criminal syndicate and, and Meyer Lansky, the relationship to Wu, then to, uh, to the Hoover and the FBI, the potential conjoinment with the Italian mob, right? And the, and the mafia, and the, the Cosa Nostra, the Kosher Nostra and the Cosa Nostra in, in engagement. And then, especially with the super mob, uh, this really, uh, you know, intent, intergenerationally evolved, let's say, uh, the Jewish mob in the United States, uh, specifically in terms of d- that described in Gus Russo's book, uh, emanating, sort of organizing out of Chicago. You then begin to see uh, in addition to intersections with other groups like the, uh, whether they're called the, the purple, uh, I forget the, the purple gang, right? The sort of Detroit, think of like Ohio, Columbus, the intersection then up to, uh, to Canada and, and Montreal and purple to- gang would have been, uh, Mo Dallas, who was, uh, I believe awarded the anti-defamation league, the torture of freedom. Isn't that right? Right. And so that's actually the perfect example of what then, 
happens is that it's all then washed, right? The, the, the mob is then washed in the next generation into philanthropy and into awards by so-called credible institutions like the Anti-Defamation League. And of course, if we, we, that's why one of the, re, we, that's one of the reasons why we went back and looked at the actual origins and the long-term machinations of groups such as like the ADL or the B'nai B'rith and that they, they have been deep state from the beginning, right? They, they didn't just, they weren't like legitimate organizations that then in like the late 1900s got involved and then wash in washing the reputation of the Mo Dalitzes. No, they were, they were that from the beginning. They were, they were deep state operations from the beginning back to the, the conjunction of the Confederate intelligence and, uh, that whole background of B'nai B'rith and the Ku Klux Klan and then the ADL and tracing that very, very uh, interesting and dark history throughout the 20th century and that whole analysis that we did around the relationship of the, you know, apparent Jewish deep state management in many ways via such organizations as the ADL, but also civil rights organizations uh, with the Jewish power very uh, either at the origins or very involved in managing the, you know, civil rights leadership, all of that kind of stuff, that whole background that we, 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 you know, I'm sure we'll keep talking about it in, into the future, but just touching on that, then in, in the super mob context and an American context, you then see that this idea of oligarchy in the United States, there's a, a sensitivity, even like the same way that Blavatnik has it, uh, being called, uh, an oligarch. There's a, an entire American establishment. Uh, sensitivity to saying that, that we have anything such as oligarchs, American oligarchs or oligarchy. The, the polite way that it's talked about is plutocracy, uh, plutocrats. And there's some fairness to that. And you know, what's interesting is like in the, the beginning of the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the Trump regime, I said that my s suspicion was that the, that Trump represented the first time in American history where the deep state had been uh, flipped on its head, basically, where the the underworld types, the black economy types, the organized crime types had actually like ascended uh, and were now commanding at the commanding heights over the national security state rather than the other way around, which I think it was more. It was always tied in together, of course, and it looks like someone like Hoover, for example, was very likely uh, implicated, if not potentially deeply compromised by, uh, via the Meyer Lansky underworld. Uh, it's so, you know, so I think it's more complex than what I'm saying right now, but that was my sense of it that, that Trump brought in. This was the, where the, the underside of the deep state by, you know, a bilayer complex had turned, it had turned over and had gone to the top. And so, and, and, and I'd say so maybe in the potential end of this Trump years, I would, I would say maybe that, that it was also the years where it became clear that America, that we went from American plutocracy to American oligarchy. And it became very obvious that we have oligarchs, just like the post Soviet sphere has oligarchs. We also have oligarchs. And though it's not as, quite as concentrated in a, you know, the resource, the, just the oil, aluminum, uh, not quite as uh, focused around that. There's a lot more high finance. There's a lot more maybe cyber te uh, technology. Uh, but we, of course, we still have the, the lineage and the legacy, both familial and business wise in terms of our, our own American history of, of our, of our of big business magnates and oligarchs and, uh, you know, the Andrew Carnegie's, the Rockefellers, like that continues on into this day. It's just expanded into where cyber, like Netanyahu pointed out in terms of, I think it was this APAC presentation potentially that things had changed in a drastic fashion in terms of the global economy, just like in over the course of 10 years or something like that, where it had been almost all like big energy uh, uh, companies, maybe defense companies, uh, finance, and then, and then 
over the course of 10 years, it basically become large, mainly high technology companies that were now in the commanding heights of Wall Street valuations and, and all of that. And so that, that's, I just wanted to, to address some of, you know, that's some of the structural, big structural stuff that I think, uh, w- was on display during the, during the Trump years. Uh, and I, I think we'll also then talk a little bit before we finish up, Greg, about the, the, Let's say that there is that this it's possible that the McInerney's and the Flynn's and the and the Trump's and the Cash Patel's and the Cohen Watnick's and now the Eric Prince's, by the way, uh, Trump has just apparently pulled American troops out of Somalia. But there is strong chatter that they're they're just sort of gone to next door, I think, maybe Kenya or something like that. They've just been drawn out of Somalia, but then. The question is, Eric Prince, ready to go, right? Right in the background, ready to go, ready to get facilitated. And so in the midst of all of that, it looks like maybe there's sort of some, it's a slop op. There's a slop op going on, not in terms of just like the amount of money that the, that, that Trump has raised in, uh, in refusing to, uh, to say that he lost the election in some fashion. They've raised a lot of money. Uh, and so that's a sort of slop op potential, but there's also this other big slop op, like the international stuff around the weapons and what is going on. What are the deals that are going on in terms of all the activity of the Kushners and the Pompeos and, you know, the visiting of the settlements and the, all the uh, UAE and the Saudis and all of that, you know, and then add on top of that, there is obviously some black ops stuff going on too. when the, with the, apparent Israeli escalation of the assassination of the Iranian nuclear scientists. Now there are, there's also chatter and video that, the, that there is an, I'm not sure, I haven't checked this. I don't know if this has been confirmed and it's interesting. It has not gotten any real mainstream coverage that, that an apparent Mossad commander was uh, assassinated on the streets of Tel Aviv. So it's very possible if that's true that that was a uh, you know a proportional response by the Iranians in the midst of this escalation uh, in, in the Israeli Iranian sphere. Um, but oh, in general, the the sense is that these are sort of slop ops on the way out, potentially including whatever they're doing uh, in in terms of purging the defense policy board and the defense business board and putting all these guys in. And sure, it definitely, we're not out of the, you know, the woods in terms of, uh, martial law as, uh, Alex Jones might want it to happen or as Michael Flynn might uh, call for, uh, to, you know, to do, to suspend it, habeas corpus for who knows how long just to do their election or whatever the heck they're actually doing. But, you know, in general, the feeling is, my feeling is, is that they're, they are, sort of putting in a lot of combination of sucking resources out, uh, emoluments. I mean, that was like one of the main concepts in terms of the Trump operation from a very personal and domestic fashion was massive emoluments. Take advantage of statecraft for pumping hundreds of millions, if not billions, into their, their own family and their own friends, coffers, long-term business relationships, all of that. Uh, and so that, that's continuing on, it looks like potentially on the, on the way out. And, uh, so we're going to have to deal with the ongoing legacy, obviously, even if they're, they're, let's say, uh, this is all some kind of theatrics. It seems like that with a McInerney type. Sure, he was high level in the U.S. Air Force, but he's not, um, he's not really cogent. He doesn't, it doesn't seem like they're actually and you know, they, like these are networks that we've analyzed that are dangerous. They are operatively dangerous. So it's not like they're, they can be just written off, but it, it seem remember what Flynn actually said, uh, about the, this is, this is hybrid warfare, right? And really that's a lot of what we see about this Trump operation, especially from like a Russian asset perspective from what Putin was looking for it. And we still have to do our follow up to uh, a geopolitical analysis that I think will be helpful too to explain where we are in terms of uh, 
uh, global geopolitics, geostrategy in terms of this question of the the nuclear, the new nuclear regime that we're apparently under, the ending of the Clear Skies Treaty. What's what's uh, Putin's uh, understanding of what Trump did in relationship to the breakdown of the of the nuclear treaties? Apparently, it looks like too that a a high level uh, Russian next generation hypersonic nuclear engineer has been arrested for treason. I think I saw that. Uh, just in the last day or so, so I don't know what that is all about. But it, it 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 it's resonant with the fact that this is a a key piece of the legacy of of what was done under under Trump. So that's the the international piece of it. I think is that it re it recreated a more wild west scenario where someone like. Putin with his next generation hypersonic nuclear capacity could be back fully at the at the military table uh, with the big boys, which would include China and the United States in a way that he wasn't as long as it was all about like troops on the ground in the middle in the Middle East and all of all of that. Um, Although they made obviously made some presence in Syria and showed they could uh, assert themselves there, but in terms of the reset of what all, you know, all of these national elites are talking about in terms of great power, uh, competition as we're sort of post, post, uh, global war on terror as the organizing concept geopolitically, geostrategically, and we're on to the great powers competition. So that, that's that piece in a domestic fashion. The it's obvious from what Flynn had said, we have digital. Remember, he said, yeah, we have digital warriors, digital, basically militia is really the word that he was probably thinking of that. they It was a hybrid. Uh, it was a militia based uh, social media based hybrid war, hybrid warriors, you might even call them. And, you know, no matter how much poo pooing there was of the Internet Research Agency by all of the 11 9 liars, we might call them 11 9 denialists. I don't know. The hot dog vendor who once catered to Vladimir Putin. <laughs> right. Like Eric, all Eric Prince does actually, you know, all Eric Prince does is he sets up buffets in Africa so that, uh, people can eat. That's all he does. He's just he's just a logistics guy for And don't ask up about China because that makes you a, a xenophobe who wants to start a who wants to start a war with China. So don't ask about Eric Prince, a uh, war criminal, uh Uber war on terror, uh clash of civilizations. We're fighting a literal crusade against uh against radical Islam or against Islam. Uh don't ask about his leading its Pierre's primary role in helping to architect this uh, Chinese uh, state repression of the uh, Uyghur Muslim minority, because then you'd just be a xenophobe. And you don't want to be that. No, but you're right, Greg. Like the the minute that you say a word about a critical word about the question of Chinese uh, surveillance technology, Uyghur Muslims, their usage of the war on terror paradigm. Uh, their, their own form of expansionism, uh, and ec- it is, you know, it's state, you could call it state capitalist imperialism for the anti-imperialists out there. And you, you, you to go, go talk to people around the world in terms of, sure, China's not drop, you know, that's why people might accept certain groups of people might ex- rather accept if they had to choose between the state capitalist imperialism of the, of the Chinese versus the uh, corporatist capitalism of the United States, as it might be called, that, that especially in the 21st century, was, is mainly associated with, uh, b- you know, bombing the Middle East and spreading, you know, spreading out drone strikes and depleted uranium, along with corporate looting of resources in the so-called third world. But yeah, sure, people will choose... Uh, Chinese uh, infrastructure and debt-based that state capitalist uh, uh, imperialism, you know, over that. But it's still, you know, there's still uh, critical words to be said of uh, state capitalist imperialism if you're a real anti-imperialist, obviously, you know. And that's not even like the the like our mode of critiquing things necessarily, but we're not afraid of going there either, you know. But you're right, though, Greg. That it is it is a situation where if you say a word about 
against uh, the rise of the Chinese uh, techno tyranny, the relationship, their relationship with Israel, uh, their relationship to their own uh, Muslim population, then it's basically just now you all you believe in in not only Cold War, you believe in a hot war, and you're just you're basically just a sycophant of Frank Gaffney. <laughs> right, you're a sycophant of uh, Frank Gaffney or of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies or whatever institute you name it because – but, you know, once again, this goes back to apparently in the world we live in, two things cannot be true at the same time. It cannot possibly simultaneously be true at the same time that, yes, while indeed there are the Tucker Carlson's of the world, the Frank Gaffney's of the world, the Committee on the Present Danger China of the world, these very much these uh, these architects and purveyors of uh, the – not just the war on terror, you know, but the actual – the actual deep ideology behind like the, the – the deepest actual meaning of like the – war on terror in terms of even beyond like the way like even the bush administration pointed out it's really it's really epitomized and reared its ugly head more than ever in the actual in the trump administration it's not just a war against the terrorists per se but it's a war um it's a civilizational war and not only is it in the middle east but it's in the west as well you know the major part of the propaganda operation to bring trump into power was the uh was the the terrorists bringing the fight not just to not just to the Middle East, but bringing the fight directly to our shores through mass migration into Europe and uh, the San Bernardino attack and the Orlando attack and the idea that this is not just a war on terror, so to speak, but it's an actual civilizational warfare. And we're not only at war with uh, radical Islam, so to speak, but we're at war with um, the the liberal institutions of the West, we talked about what we went back to earlier. Is there any real distinction between a liberal and a communist, right? You know, so it's the actual, like from a global perspective, the actual epitomization of the, the, of the worst of the ideology of the actual meaning of like this war on terror from the worst uh, purveyors and architects of it. Just because they're, you know, just because they're, pushing this China threat in a very, very disingenuous, very uh, dishonest manner that is designed to see, to get Americans to view China as their enemy in terms of this artificial, largely fake reliving of the uh, Cold War era tensions, you know, America versus communism uh, and all this freedom versus tyranny, capitalism versus communism, uh, uh Judeo Christianity versus the godless, materialistic, paganistic, whatever you want to call it, values of the rest of the world who does not subscribe to Judeo Christian American exceptionalism. Just because that's being taken advantage of, can it not also be true that at the same time there's some very, very, very real and very, very serious, um, issues and problems that need to be addressed in a manner that goes beyond the way like the Tucker Carlson's and uh, Frank Gaffney's and uh, Committee on the Present Danger Chinas of the World um, dis- use and weaponize the uh, weaponize this problem with their own their disingenuous uh, bad jacketing of the narrative. And so apparently we live in a society where two things cannot be true simultaneously. And of course, that's one of the things we don't subscribe to here at the antidote where we try to bridge that gap of, yes, these guys are problematic. And at a very deep level, it appears that many of these same interests are actually much like the dynamic we've seen that we've analyzed long term with uh, Russia, Soviet, Soviet interests. It appears that at the end of the day, there's some, there's almost there's some strange bedfellows going on here, and we, I go back once again to that uh, whole dynamic with the arrest of the uh, Chinese national at the uh, the day spa within the proximity of Mar-a-Lago that Robert Kraft, the Patriots owner, was uh was arrested for soliciting um, soliciting sex there, and all of the photos that came out of the prominent uh, GOP figures, right wing uh, conservative movement figures with this. Uh, Chinese national and so and that and a number of other things as well everything going into the Trump family's own business dealings with uh with the Chinese the 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 CCP bring down the CCP as uh, Steve Bannon and uh, Guo uh Miles Guo love to love to tout on their on their BS program a war room pandemic so it, it, and by the way what you show me Eric Eric Greitens is now a new 
voice on, on America's network. real real America's <laughs> voice network, which carries our war room pandemic. Yes, uh, Eric Greitens, the disgraced uh, former governor, acolyte, peers, protege, and many perhaps of uh, the Makovsky brothers in uh, St. Louis, uh, among mm. other people. But, and so, and to my point, though, um, the uh, well, it really does appear to be, and we've analyzed this before and we will again, um, because I still really need to get a stronger perspective on like the, the Chinese aspect of the foreign operation with the, with the Republican Party and, and its tentacles into bipartisanship with, with aspects of the Democratic Party as well, but particularly in the stream we were talking about earlier with the GOP, there does appear to be as much like with the Russians, a strange bedfellows kind of thing where all that it seems to be this, and now this, uh, the, the real perpetuation and the constant uh reminder of like just the you know China has become our number one threat and enemy, which we were talking about among ourselves before, seems to be a direct response to. And it's been a narrative that's been out there in the long term for years now, but this most recent stream of a uh, China propaganda narrative from the right seems to be a response to what we were talking about earlier. With that, we might get back into this with the analysis of the uh, Biden incoming, some of the incoming uh, Biden. Harris cabinet picks on a foreign policy uh, angle later on, but the uh, direct response to this is a pivot to China, which goes back into this whole some of the stuff you were talking about earlier with the great powers analysis. But anyway, my point is is that while poop by poo pooing the any type of criticism of uh, China and its policies or any type of whether it's Uyghur Muslims or whether it's a uh, repression or whether it's global scale the Belt Road Initiative and Chinese own, China's own you might call them imperialist uh, goals on a global geopolitical perspective you know not only are we um not only are we morally um not only is it morally unacceptable to give a fast to this but also it's leaving out an important facet of analysis that i think needs to be strongly considered that not all seem to be even among the china hawks and the chinese uh communist party in and of itself and that there's things that need to be analyzed there from a long-term and a short-term perspective of you know is this really all it seems to be or are a lot of these entities playing batting for the same team at the end of the day so to speak so that's another thing that gets lost out of this like complete poo-pooing of uh of this uh very real problem that you know we have to unfortunately uh you know, we have to at the very least be honest about much less be equipped to actually uh understand ways to try and uh circumvent this and the the very negative uh global consequences of this entity uh, basically uh replacing the the Yan- yankee yeah yankee go home yeah that's a, that sounds great but what's it going to be replaced by and so we can't have conversations about these things if we're just poo-pooing the uh the conversation trying to not have a conversation about it in the first place which so many people on the you know, anti-imperialist left or not, and aspects of the right as well, like this kind of this re- left-right, uh, whatever, you, anti-war, anti-imperialist uh, uh, perspective do not want to have a conversation. Anti-regime change war TM and anti-new cold war TM, basically, uh, where it's not really thought process, it's reactionary horseshoe dynamics that don't really address and break down the, what I would call, you know, and this could be understood from a left perspective, superstructures. Understand, you know, the, dig into the superstructures. Cause once you get into superstructure, you're getting way beyond any kind of thing of the sort of imperialist pole, uh, the imperialist, you know, axis of the world and then the, the anti-imperialist pole or axis. No. And, and this is one of the things that we, we've been working to unpack is that to understand the Cold War properly, you have to un- you have to understand the actual superstructure as a a put an undermining of of actual uh, international diplom- real international diplomatic relations, such as what was beginning to head in the that direction in relationship to you know people like maybe Kennedy and Khrushchev and where the the so called hawks surrounding them seem to have intervened in different ways, potentially, uh, maybe very physically. But the main thing was that they, as, as they're apparently hawks, what they're not, they're, they're really doves 
to conflict or they're, they're doves to the perception of conflict to keep the conflict going so that it escalates if all of the usual suspect types, you know, from the military industrial complex, but also the things that are really coming into focus right now, which have to do with surveillance powers, uh, bio tyranny, technology. What is the end point? What is the purpose and the end point of, of, of cyber technology itself? Who's in control of it? Whose purposes are being served by it? Right. And so and then in an American context, you're right into the realm of the question of the Constitution, the struggle over the, 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 who's, who does the Republic belong to? Does it belong uh, from the get go to a, 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 an, a, a, a landed elite or does it really belong to we, the people, all of us, even if it's going to take a long time for all of us to claim our right to be at the table? Uh, in the basic, you know, in American context, of course, like, uh, you know, uh, African Americans and women joining their like place at the table of being literally, uh, seen as part of we the people with the full rights and responsibilities and privileges and politically and all of that. And so that is where the struggle is, I think, in relationship to really unpacking and de- and de- deconstructing these very toxic, very dangerous, very tyrannical superstructures that, that are, are related and engendered by things that we could understand in terms of international, you know, affairs or nationalism or countries or governments and things like that. But there's something going on beyond that where the apparent standoffs between the hawks is somehow facilitating some greater superstructural plan. And of course, in the mix of all that, this is one of the other reasons why we work to unpack some espionage history too, or deep, deep event and deep state history from during the Cold War, such as these really, you know, even the, the Kennedy assassination, like we talked about, and we, we sort of avoided, we avoided touching on it during this uh, anniversary. We just felt like it was not quite immediately as irrelevant as uh, it needed to be to uh, get our butts in gear to re- reassess the Kennedy assassination. But it still really is important in terms of understanding the dynamic, the espionage dynamics, because it is in the espionage dynamics that you can read the superstructural interests, the superstructural motives, uh, the transnational motives in such events, right? The looking at people such as James Angleton and this still un, not quite yet developed answer to what role did he play in relationship not only to Israel, but in relationship to the backdoor aspects of the Cold War and the Soviet U.S. dynamics and that whole access from his buddy Kim Philby in the near the city of London um, both a Zionist agent and a Soviet agent, but then bring in someone like Victor Rothschild, who is the missing character in that circle, who then really brings in the this further, longer-term, strong tie to, from Israel up through the city of London and then back out to the Soviet Union. And I just want to point out, in, in sort of closing this thought about the dangers of what you are pointing out, Greg, in terms of people uh, shirking the duty to be honest about the totality of the international facts, uh, which includes, you know, talking about China, too, or, you know, that Victor Rothschild, the very interesting and very dark background there is not just that he was a Soviet spy, apparently, along with being a, a, a Zionist and Israeli spy of some sort, including like helping set up like the modern incarnation of the Weizmann Institute with Weizmann himself, and which is at the epicenter of the, uh, you know, the, what the, this deep science behind is Israel's modern weaponry and nuclear program over the longer term. And then ultimately up into the age of, uh, bio and cyber and all of that. But I just want to point out that Victor Rothschild also in a, in a UK context, he was not only crucial to these, some of these questions about, of course, the high level Ted Heath, uh, prime minister associated apparently, um, 
child sex ring, pedophile uh, leverage ops, blackmail operations. Look into that background there. Uh, at, but also he helped set up some of the, I believe, maybe the first biotechnology investment uh, structure company a financial instrument in the world, I think. And one of the things that he did for the Soviets was he was deeply involved in the UK bioweapons lab, the Port and Downs, for decades, really, and apparently, you know, porting out information back to the Soviet sphere. Um, and so I guess the thought that I had was that the danger of uh, being uh, risk averse to dealing with China, for example, is that in a similar fashion to where the, the sort of silent Democrats, the silent progressives basically ceded the election fraud landscape to the Sidney Powell Krakens and the Michael Flynn's and the, the McInerney crazy types, you know, basically spinning narrative, just tales and like you pointed out, Roger Stone and the North Korean ballots and all of that. Rather than the much more sober analysis of who did what in 2004, example, what's the nature of these machine rigging? Is it all about dominion and connections to Hugo Chavez's a hungry ghost coming in to eat your ballots? Or is it that all a misdirection very likely from what are the predominant? I, you know, this on Friday, I called uh, the Idaho one of the biggest, uh, you know, shifts uh, from 2016 to 2020 in terms of an advantage to Trump was a ton of these Southern Texas districts all, and Texas basically is all uh, ES and S and heart intercivic. And then another one outlying one in terms of these counties around the country, the you know top 10 in the last maybe 20 years in terms of a shift uh, from, from one election to the next was a, County in Idaho and uh, I called them up and it's ESNS systems there too. And Idaho is actually very similar to Texas where it's basically split. It looks like and uh, they haven't published it all on the internet. And, but I, the, the, someone at the secretary of state's office in Idaho gave me the, uh, the list of all the numbers of the county election supervisors. So, but he says that they're basically heart intercivic and ESNS. So my point is instead of that in being front and center, that it's very likely actually that people like Lindsey Graham or, you know, or, you know, someone in that realm, Susan Collins, maybe that there is a Senate operation going on and there was very likely a Trump operation in the opposite direction. Now I'm not saying there was no like, you know, uh, sort of Democrat city, uh, you know, ballot fraud or election fraud but the, or you know voter fraud but this stuff is not panning out as as when i'm looking at it it doesn't seem to be panning out so maybe there's there's still some inklings that there was something untoward happening in certain places but when we talk about mass scale industrial scale why are these the vast networks such as the es and s the heart intercivics being totally pointed away from by this red herring stink operation by Sidney Powell. Uh, and oh, and look at, look at her back. The, her, well, she has a company called Dominion. That's sort of interesting. Go look that up. Sidney Powell, uh, owner of a company called Dominion. And that's all pointing away from this very, uh, deeply researched background of the, you know, Council for National Policy, the Rove, the Blackwell, the Mike Connell operations. That's basically now known to some, to some serious extent now around election fraud that actually is used to, uh, you know, fraud at the presidential level in 2004. And of course, these carry types, the Democrat types, these progressive sort of silent types that I mentioned, uh, which would include someone like Simone Sanders, as I've talked about before, who was silent uh, on the matter, very actually reactionary on the matter when I questioned about the uh, Bernie Sanders primary in 2016 in relationship to Hillary Clinton. And now she's in the communications of the Biden administration. And so that whole crew basically seeded this whole field um, because they're, they're, they're implicated in some way. There's some kind of thing going on where, you know, we've, talked about in different ways and we'll continue to research this question of, you know, why did Kerry not say something? Is he compromised? Yeah, you know, maybe they, they will dig back into that 2002 uh, Epstein-Junkerman incident episode at the uh, 
the uh the UK estates uh out in the hills outside of the GCHQ headquarters in Wexner owned uh you know estates in the run up to the Iraq war and by the way remember that that whole Wexner war Frank Luntz right our uh, Finky kid Arthur Finkelstein operation that was actually started not in the spring uh that was actually started in the fall of 2002 and what we're aware of is that Wexner war uh document that came out after the war had been launched where it was leaked to uh, uh electronic intifada i think and Ali Abu Nima reported on it in democracy now about how the after the iraq war had been launched they were working frank luntz was being sponsored by um by uh, Wexner and there's actually another group, the Israel Project. You go look at that, the Israel Project. But they were uh, working to figure out how to message, i.e. Frank Luntz is just a pollster. He's a, just a pollster. No, he's a PR guru. He's a messaging guru. They were studying how are you going to message, uh, and this is all in the Israel lobby, uh, and, for, and foreign, the U.S. foreign policy by John Mearsheimer and Stephen Walt, which I've gotten back out because I think it's going to be increasingly relevant uh, in a potential Biden administration, actually. I, a real quick note on that book is, um, uh, I think with the benefit of hindsight, you're sure to find a lot of things that, um, you probably or did not pick up on the first time you looked through that book with, uh, all of the years of, uh, of knowledge and things that, you know, you've come to learn and uh, understand over the past, probably since the last time you read the book. So I imagine a lot's going to, uh, a lot of stuff would stick out the benefit of hindsight from that book with the reassessment of it. Oh yeah. There's some, there's some crazy stuff in it that includes like, um, well, actually this is not in it, but, but in, in researching this episode, uh, around the messaging around the Iraq war, then ran back into this question of uh, Makovsky, you mentioned the Makovsky brothers before. They're both brothers from St. Louis, Missouri, uh, the, the, you know, the Eric Greitens homelands. Uh, and the Michael Makovsky, the, the Jinsa, eventual Jinsa executive, who we talked about a lot in relationship to the Gary Vogler book about the politics of oil. And when people can go back to our show titled The War for, uh, the war for oil for Israel, the Iraq yeah. war for oil for Israel. And Vogler really breaks a lot of it that, that down. But a lot of that, the basic parameters of the Iraq operation and the parallel intelligence uh, operation that was being run, uh, actually was already had been broken down in the Israel lobby book more than 10 years earlier. Um, but Mikulski playing this key role in the the oil, uh, the coalition provisional authority in Iraq in managing an oil operation and uh, and what Vogler lays out. And he was very close to this. All of this was that this was being done the for Israeli partisan reasons, the, even the oil aspect of the Iraq war, which the Israel lobby book points out that which took a much deeper back seat, including the whole Halliburton or the military contractor, military industrial complex uh, motive is way, way back seat. Maybe not even like the oil motive in that context is actually might be non-existent in relationship to the Israel lobby motive or the Likud lobby motive. Uh, and Mikulski is a interesting character because he he, I think he takes off after high school in America and goes directly to Israel. He works with Shimon Perez. Uh, he was, he's identified by Gary Vogler, who has contacts in the U.S. intelligence community as having spent five years in, at least five years in Israeli foreign service. And they say 98% of people in Israeli foreign service are spooks or spies. Thus, they, they, the assertion from Gary Vogler's contacts in the U.S. intelligence community is that Michael Makovsky is a credibly accused Israeli agent of some sort. And he was put in the, at the head of the alleged U.S. Pentagon, uh, oil management during the Iraq, Iraq war. But it turns out that Makovsky, while he was in Israel, he was a but he was a, apparently a buddy. He lived in a in a West Bank settlement, and he was a 
apparently a close friend with the uh, accused assassin of uh, of uh, Steve Pachinik's target, <laughs> Rabin, right, yes. Greg? Indeed, yes, yes, indeed. And so, I just in in finishing up, closing the loop of the question of the marketing of the Iraq War, that the the Israel Project, I think that's what it's called. Go look at it. It just got shut down in recent years, and it really sort of flew under the radar. Um, but what's very interesting is the you remember the the woman who asked the question. Right after me, Greg, when Dennis Ross is, you know, get, getting off on seeing a self-identified Jewish American man getting hauled out by, uh, Israeli trained, Israeli partisan paid, uh, Homeland Security Fusion Center associated detective and private security contractor for asking, for be asking an argument, engaging in argumentative discourse, a citizens, aggressive citizens press, you know, things that are totally protected, the most protected under the First Amendment. Dennis, while Dennis Ross was like getting off on that, and I've, my wife and I have looked at the video and it almost looks like potentially Ross is like mouthing potentially like a, a Yiddish swear word to me or something like that when, when he's looking at this all going on. And then, and then he finally sort of realizes, oh, maybe I should, you know, continue with the questions. So he turns to the other side. And there's a woman on the other side at the, at the microphone there, the first step on the other side of the microphone. Her name's Karen Pack. And, uh, she asked a question about then what can we do to combat, you know, the whole UN, the human rights and that whole agenda, right? Okay. Uh, and that's while, you know, we're being forced out, ejected from this public forum, uh, based on political viewpoint, uh, discrimination and then, I and the librarian are arrested. We're charged for over a year. Uh, and then meanwhile, this woman, Karen Pack, worked, she worked with this, uh, the, the Israel project. I believe probably during the time that it was associated with, with the Wexner, uh, foundation and contracting with the question of marketing the Iraq war. But what's not talked about a lot, and it is talked about in the Israel lobby book, is that before that whole Wexner War Fetrakis episode, they're talking about after the war has begun and, you know, how can we market the, the Iraq War as, you know, not about Israel's interest, but in, in fully in line with American interests for democracy, expansion and, uh, you know, morality and all of that, 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 that the fall before that, they were actually mark, it was marketing for trying to convince the Israelis and any sort of Israeli partisans to be as quiet as possible in the run up to the launching of the war, because it was becoming so obvious that it was an Israeli partisan driven war. And it was basically an open secret in, in DC and in American elite circles. They, everybody knew it, right? And even there was a strong push and we'll return to all of this at another, at another time. But that then lines up with this very strange connection to Epstein and Junkerman and this trip with that has been said to have been with two U.S. sitting U.S. senators at this Wexner estate in the U.K. Highlands, you know, fairly close to their uh, NSA headquarters, GCHQ, uh, in, in the run up to this uh, 2003 launching of the Iraq war. And now just one last thing. And Maybe this is a little bit of a retrospective that we're doing, Greg, conceptually, you know, at the end of, you know, the antidote. We've been, we've been, uh, uh, largely, we were, we, you founded us, Greg, before Trump came in, but we've been around this whole time and we've been working on not only excavating facts that are crucial, both in the, in our contemporary moment, but in history, but also working on uh, evolving our analysis so that it can be more clarifying and more helpful towards what the heck is actually going on. And then as a precursor to then what then can we do or what do we want to do? What do we, what do we propose as potentially an alternative, which I imagine we, you know, we'll just, uh, you know, touch in as we finish up here, as we talk about who the potentially incoming Biden, uh, Folks tortured some Obama tortured some folks. He's talking about folks and stuff. But um, so I, I'm just uh, th 
I just want to say that I brought that whole thing up about the potential leverage and compromise, the question of two sitting U.S. senators in the run up to the Iraq war. Go back and look at at our uh, episode that we did after we attended the documentary about and with Kath- it wasn't a documentary. It's actually a, a feature film uh, a, about and with uh, Catherine Gunn, the GCHQ key whistleblower in the run up to the Iraq war. And so this geography of Epstein and Junkerman, and by the way, Junkerman involved with the apparently last sort of largely invested Epstein company uh, before the jail episode in August of 2019, uh, uh, Carbon 9-11, which is important because it seems very parallel to something like Palantir. Which is front and center. There, are, you know, some of the incoming uh, officials in but with Biden, including the new D, uh, uh, national security advisor. Is she the national security advisor or the DNI, the director of national intelligence, uh, Avril Haines? I can't remember. Do you remember? Just Greg? a moment. Just a moment. Okay, just a moment. that's okay. Um, but she worked with Palantir. and there, and at the same time, if we're yeah, also, Avril Haines is, um, I believe the. Uh, DNI, she would be replacing uh, John Ratcliffe. <laughs> rats off the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the rats are off the cliff. But meanwhile, then some more organized, competent, nicer types who are nicer when they cover up CIA torture and institute uh, legal architectures of drone strike programs and work with Palantir data military contractors. Uh, are coming in. And so there's a whole nother dynamic here that needs to be looked at very, very specifically and in its own uh, way. And so th- that, that question of the, of the compromise of the run up to the Iraq war, uh, I, it, I just wanted to complete the thought here. I'm sorry. I'm so all over the place. I got a lot of, I feel like I have lo- like about 10, 10 mental tabs open right now that I'm trying to bring back around here. Still the same way all the time. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, the, well, I hope our audience will uh, forgive us, Greg. But the, my, my point back to your really important point about the dangers of not addressing China in a serious fashion is that it can lead not only to the question of China, but also it seeds the, the terrain just as the, these potentially compromised folks in the, in the terms of even someone up to John Kerry, who, by the way, is in the new Biden, uh, incoming Biden administration in terms of a new climate envoy to the UN, that wh- why were they the dogs who didn't bark on what even in this time of a potential election fraud and, and, you know, Nancy Pelosi sitting there, she's totally exposed now. The emperor has no clothes. The mob, the uh, mob mayor's daughter has no political clothes. She did not uh, go. She did not empower the American people with quote unquote stimulus, i.e., our national inheritance in the midst of a ill likely. You know, it was probably the the COVID nineteen probably came from an American uh, lab of some sort, and this is all some kind of fallout that's hitting the Americans apparently the hardest in the world. And the leader, so-called, of the opposition party couldn't even get some basic funding to the American people. Dozens of millions who are uh, who are un- and have major food trouble, sh- food shortages. Go look at the line; these massive lines, you know, of people who have fairly nice cars, like you know SUVs and nice uh, minivans and stuff like that, but. Millions and millions of Americans are now food insecure, many of them for the very first time. We've had a food, you know, uh, a food and poverty and food insecurity, a major mass crisis in the United States for a long time. But now that's escalating. And then you add that to the question of the economics and the rents coming due and evictions in the middle of the whether it's the dark winter or the darkest winter. We don't know yet, but it's one of those, you know, it's being identified and Nancy Pelosi basically refused. It looks like she played politics. She basically refused to uh, make a deal with Mitch McConnell that would benefit her constituents in order to play Trump 
presidential politics in some way. And now she's saying, well, we're going to make a deal. It's going to be half half as good for the American people. But we have the presidency and we have the vaccines. And uh, that's not going to do anything for the American people during the transition, at the very least. And it's also not going to do anything for the American people over the course of this escalating, uh, you know, in terms of destruction, health destruction. And go just go, you know, anybody who's still like COVID, quote unquote, denialist, go go check in with the nursing community or the frontline healthcare workers in terms of what they are actually dealing with in the in the midst of like you know people who show up with covid and they're still in denial that it's actually a thing because Donald Trump told them it didn't it was going to disappear someday and and they're they're dying of covid while they're still in denial of covid almost to some extent you know so Nancy Pelosi is totally totally exposed now and she's submitting her constituents to the darkest winter. Nancy Pelosi voted and she voted for the darkest winter. And so that's going to be, have to be uh, uh, addressed. And so that whole crew, basically when they don't deal with, they seed the field of something like election fraud <laughs> to, yeah. to the Michael Flynn's and the Crickens, they are doing the same kind of thing that happens in relationship to seeding the whole field around China to the Frank Gaffney's. And then finally, my point is, and this connects back to COVID, that what happened was that instead of the deep investigation that should have been going on from day one, and that started to happen in certain spheres in terms of, you know, there was little bits, you know, fits and starts all around in terms of where did COVID come from? How, what is it? How did it, how was it, was it, was it a lab creation? And that all got totally devolved and uh, upended into anti-maskism yes. and COVID hoaxism. And that is, uh, that is, and part of that, I believe, was the question of China, because what happened is you had the Bannons, basically, and the Tom Cottons uh, putting the whole question of COVID as a bioweapon, let's say, or an engineered virus potentially, or being used as a weapon of some sort. And they put it all the way into Wuhan and China's hands. And so that basically dirtied that up and everybody just sort of gave it up and uh, and then succumbed. Those that were in the spheres that originally had gotten to some of the core of this stuff, for example, even someone like Whitney Webb, who wrote some of the most important early articles, like in the early aspects of 2020 in terms of uh, bats, engin virus engineering, DARPA, that kind of stuff that was like right in the realm. And then over the course of the year, the, the, that kind of journalism was subsumed in many ways by the the sort of covid hoaxers and the anti-maskers and, and really irresponsibly so in terms of a lot of those kinds of spheres in terms of what we are actually seeing in an American context. And and the racial aspect of this is very difficult to deny, too, uh, in terms of the African-Americans having been hit really super hard around something like and, uh, COVID. And that's really that's really important. I think very that's something people need to understand, because. My own perspective on this, and we really do need to go back and do a, I want to, uh, before, before too long, really go back and do a deep dive into, uh, into COVID and the a combination of like what we, how we, what we uh, perceive the reality of COVID to be combined with what we see is a very, it's very similar to other things that have gone on throughout the era of Trump and the era of, um, of the new media and this mass, um, the COVID narrative, a lot of what we're seeing play out with the COVID narrative, everything from what you're talking about with the taking legitimate questions of bioweapon to, well, it's a hoax or, you know, no one's really dying or the masks is a, you know, wearing a mask in public is the new form of tyranny for the government to, you know, enslave us with or whatnot. And um, we do need to go back and do a and do a deep dive into a combination of things regarding that and the propaganda networks that have uh, 
I think, have taken advantage of all these varying narratives. Everything from blame China. China, as Donald <laughs> Trump would say. Blame China. <laughs> China. To blame, blame China all the way to um, the, oh, it's a hoax, the masks of the new tyranny and all of that. So I really want to go back to that. But what you're bringing up with the effect that this is having on particularly aspects of the you know, non-European, non-Caucasian, white American population, particularly African American population. That's and like I'm coming to grips with my own realization that like the small the world I live in, Kansas City, Missouri, it's largely confined to family and say a few, you know, a few people who I'm close with outside of my immediate family. But it's a very small world I ultimately live in, as knowledgeable as I like to think I am in terms of like the the way the world in terms of uh geopolitics in terms of like having a strong i believe principled uh philosophy and outlook on the world and the events going on around us i really do live in a very small world and it's confined to a very small group of people in my life and sometimes i think we lose sight of the fact that what's going on in our world is not indicative of what is going on in the world around us or even in the country around us and I think it's difficult for a lot of people because, you know, you talk about these racial disparities and it's difficult for a lot of people to, I think, consciously deal with a mass medical emergency when they don't see it hitting them directly, per se. Not to say that could change. I mean, if these, you know, some of the trends that seem to be coming out of places like South Dakota indicate that that very well, um, could be changing or has already changed in terms of demographics. But what you're saying, the, the racial effects, and I think a lot of Americans do not see this because it does not directly affect them, among other things. And I think that that's really a – that's something I think really needs to be – and that's a lot of facets of our society. Like we don't see what doesn't affect us directly. I, as a Caucasian American, do not per se see what affects other demographic aspects of the population as much as within my little circle and can't see. So I'm thinking like, it's just an example of, and I'm making a big social, I'm making a big broader statement out of this little point here, but like, you know, expanding upon just what we're seeing, whether it's within our family circles, whether it's within our, the media we consume and take in and like seeing things outside of that. And it's, it's hard to do, but that's why it's important to really be grounded. I think in serious, um, a seriously, a combination of, I would say, a serious moral and ethical, uh, empathetic perspective of the world around us, but also moving outside of our own boxes of like just what we're, a combination of what we're comfortable with and what we know and broadening our horizons on things. And I think that this would really, um, ha- help people to have a great a grasp of a greater understanding of perhaps what really might be going on with, uh, this massive uh, medical uh, crisis, at the very least to say, um, that is taking place in this country and globally, but particularly in relation to our country. And there's a lot of areas where people would come together on. Because I think a combination of a serious response to this medical emergency combined with the very real effects that you're talking about that people are feeling uh, economically, financially, in terms of food shortages and the and then even going back to the behavior of like the Nancy Pelosi's and the bipartisan disgraceful reaction to all things related to COVID, everything from the the big bailout at the very beginning, which was essentially just a stimulus, which is essentially just a big, once again, another another big business bailout, the bipartisan nature of that, how no questions were allowed to be asked about that, to how the, from that to the complete, um, lo- looks like a large scale, just mass fraud grift of the, uh, of the small business loans that were not, to, to not go to small businesses. You're starting to see there's more videos coming out of like business owners speaking out about the hypocrisy of the fact that these wealthy interests that have, that have the financial means to take care of themselves as it was, were benefiting more from the allotment of what uh, was supposed to be small business loans than the businesses themselves who were supposed to benefit from this. So I think you really step outside of like, if, if it's, it's not easy to do, but I think it's important to try to step outside of your own boundaries of understanding of what's going on around us and i think that something like that could bring a lot of people together in terms of like an actual real united front response to the 
catastrophe going on around us it's in so many ways that is affecting that is affecting us and is going to continue to affect us as um as time goes on here as we're in a longer state of uh very likely uh extended lockdowns and the permanent effect it's going to have on everything from from business to the way we live our lives in so many different ways and manners well i appreciate those those sentiments greg because i think they're spiritually important right now especially like the at this there's it there is there's a lot of trauma in, that is going on and of course people who experience more economic or psychological or biological uh difficulty or destruction obviously have the most trauma in their families you know especially for people who die or commit suicide or who are totally wiped out they have the the biggest burden of trauma but this is there's a you know there's a much bigger scope to this trauma at some level in terms of as a as a nation and as as a world in many ways too and so i think that 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 perspective that you're bringing to it to the the openness the open it's to me what it sounds like you're saying is like it's a crucial moment to b- both open our our minds uh, or our eyes to expand our horizons in terms of our familiar surroundings, both physical and intellectual and moral and political, but then to also then at the same time open our hearts, uh, reopen our hearts maybe, which are, there are hearts maybe, it's possible that the, you cannot, like if you're, for example, you're a, a nurse practitioner who's seeing a lot of, you know, death and body bags, it, at some level, you, there's a certain amount of you maintain your humanity, but you also sort of guard your heart potentially just in order to be able to do what you are required to do via your, your calling, your profession, your human morality, your commitment, any of the, that combination there. And so I think in the moment that that's a good, you know, a good understanding for us is that it makes sense that we, probably have closed off to some extent in relationship to when you have escalating uh, trauma for and certain people are being hit harder than you, there is a potentially natural human reaction to guard, to, you know, to guard just so that we can be able to get get through what we need to get through for for us and ours, you know, and and then at the same time, we need to then figure out to how to proactively and uh you know with with intent intentionally reopen our both our mind and our hearts uh to to our to our fellow human beings and to and to this moment too because i actually think there's a lot of um danger there's both a lot of danger and there's also a lot of possibility politically that will open up um and that need that there's a necessity behind the our engagement with the possibility, and a lot of it bo- politically in terms of the pragmatics of how you actually can begin to build a politics that brings people together behind real serious principles and real serious pragmatic solutions that need to be done fairly rapidly in many ways uh, on a whole lot of scales that we can talk more over the course of this you know, upcoming months and years that, that, that the basis of a lot of that is going to be an opening of one's perspective to others of lots of different backgrounds and especially political, uh, backgrounds or, 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 uh, understandings. Um, so I think there's a lot of power in what you, uh, are, you just, uh, articulated Greg. And, um, so I, I appreciate that. And I think that that sort of the, the, that, that it feels like a, a a a gift of our conversation uh today is that of is that awareness uh that you brought to us um so maybe we should i don't know if we should maybe we should just talk another maybe 10 15 minutes greg on the in, uh aspects of the biden uh team assembled at this point and what it might mean uh about what the potential Biden Harris administration will be about what it might look like, what things we need to watch out for, 
where where we need to be engaged uh and uh and then uh, finish finish it off what do you think yeah that sounds good and if you don't mind i'd like to uh just try to i'll try to be quick in my um comments but i'd like to go back to the domestic moment in terms of what we we're talking about before with the you know flynn McGinnity, military types calling for a martial law and what that could possibly lead to because i think at this point um, i just wanted to go back to this i think at this point i do i'm largely with the assessment of uh, our friend uh, john brisson and his uh his guest on his channel the other night at uh, billy ray valentine in terms of really this does appear to be like something that's not going to actually come to fruition in this moment uh as far as like it's almost the way they described it is like this is almost like testing the waters to see like a reaction to the scenario being floated out there like a martial law type of a military military carried out martial law scenario taking place in this country and so you kind of look at it like that but a couple things i want to say on this is kind of a follow-up to what we were talking about in our last show as well of like the potential danger of the moment is that while i think it's unlikely right now in this moment um that like anything other than like joe biden and kamala harris taking the oath of office on inauguration day is any any other scenario seems to be very unlikely to happen outside of that but while that's the case there's two things i think we need to um be mindful of here number one is that we knew that this would be the exact we not not necessarily everything that's going on but we knew in general like how donald trump would react to not winning an election we knew that this was going to be the reaction this is exactly how he's going to react he wasn't going to accept it there's going to be a massive public propaganda effort to ensure that a large very large portion of the population does not accept the results no matter what and so that's definitely been successful but something that you know you knew was going to be coming from the moment it was first believed and seen that trump was going to have a tough re-election race i mean we knew exactly how he would respond and trump was not disappointed in the slightest bit with regard to that and he responded exactly the way you'd expect him to but he also reacted the way a an authority would be authoritarian dictator would respond to not winning an election and so when you talk about like the nightmare scenarios the things that you've never seen you never imagined coming here to America that people like I believe, you know, Sarah Kinsey or talk so strongly and with such a prescient perspective on it's because of trends like this and what it ultimately leads to. And the fact now we've got like military generals talking about floating the idea out there of martial law and this the night what an absolutely nightmarish scenario that would be because there's no such thing as a limited martial law if martial law were to be declared so that hypothetically so that the military could oversee a re-voting that is there's going to be nothing limited about that i mean it, it's it, it's an absolute um guaranteed recipe for a, a monstrosity to come upon this come upon the society so so out with that but the last thing is i want to say like even if we get out of this moment relatively unscathed so to speak if the worst thing that's happening with the uh this dod shakeup in the um even what you were talking about before and we'll have to go back to this at some point with the uh the shakeups that went on in terms of the uh overseeing of uh aspects of our uh of our nuclear stock even if the worst thing to come out of this is a combination of like uh of preparing the way for massive pardons or whatever combined with ensuring that uh that eric prince style nationless uh military contractors are able to go in and replace the u.s military in some of our overseas endeavors even if that's the worst consequences at the immediate moment long term when we have this such a large portion of the population that will not accept um that Donald Trump did not win this presidential election combined with the more on the surface crazy sounding rhetoric from the Mike Flynn's of the world. It could very well just be what you were talking about with the uh, the, the dynamics of creating digital soldiers and all this and largely a, a something carried out largely propaganda warfare carried out on the digital sphere. But in terms of a long term analysis on this, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris taking office. January 2021 does not get us out of the woods. I mean, we are out there where this has been 
floated as a real as a possible thing to happen by very influential members of the United States military retired, but still very, very influential. And let's have large, particularly Michael Flynn's case is almost like a would be like a godlike figure within like the MAGA Trump base. And that this is being floated out there with millions and millions of people who are prepared to justify pretty much any type of I – don't, I hate to say this, but I do not know what length – just how much people would be willing to justify in the name of the election was stolen from us and our president was was illegally def- – illegally removed from office basically as a result of a fraudulent election. So even with the incoming administration actually coming in with all the problems outside of even the problems of like Biden Harris administration, I think we'll talk about some of those here in a minute when I'm finished with this. But outside of that, we're not out of the woods in that we could very well see if this type of talk is being floated around there now. Almost unprecedented, I think, for people within the military to be speaking like this publicly. Um, this is being floated out there. It's we cannot discount the possibility that in the long term we will see, you know, we could very well see a scenario that you've only heard about happening in banana republics and in other countries throughout the world that is you could never foresee happening in America. It could never happen here. You know, we cannot dismiss that. And who knows, like, how the escalation of things in terms of uh, the continued sowing of uh, domestic division and the Domestic situation getting worse with relation to the ongoing uh, pandemic and everything surrounding that. So, you know, we're not, you know, we're in a we're in a situation where not just in the immediate future between now and January twentieth, but going on from there, where we are facing that we have to really realistically look at some previously unforeseen uh, scenarios happening here domestically. Oh, I to- I totally agree with you that, and I appreciate you following that up because. My sense of the the danger of the Michael Flynn hybrid warriors is that even if we do not encounter the worst case scenario during the transition or lack thereof, that the, the, they have created such a, a massive and effective uh, hybrid warrior set, a, a chaos warfare set in this country to the tune of probably millions and millions and millions of people. And it's not, of course, it's not all, it's not like all Trump supporters, obviously it's not that, you know, but there is this very strong base, especially as it was then developed via something like QAnon. And now we see the, you know, the escalation or the elevation of the um, real quick, Jeremy, mm-hmm. I just want to say you're right. You're absolutely right. It's not every Trump supporter. It's not, but I will say this, I can tell you like from, you know, media that I hear and listen to within like the talk radio realm of things is that while, you know, you're by and large, your, your mainstream GOP commentators are not going to endorse like, you know, martial law or chaos theories, but also the, the Rush Limbaugh's of the world, Sean Hayes world, they're doing absolutely nothing to try to, um, even alert their audiences that they're, that that this kind of talk is very seriously going on. So at the very least, even like people who are not, not privy to having this type of mindset regarding like the way, like the more, say more triggered, uh, you know, social media, people who are very much on social media who follow things like QAnon or even some of the more, you know, QAnon light that the that operations that are out there, you know, there's still a very, there's no, there's virtually no pushback anywhere from within like the, the conservative, like Republican sphere against any of this, uh, talk that's going on. So I just want to throw it in there. Oh yeah. And it's definitely a, uh, a shock. It's a sort of a hybrid warfare shock troop scenario. As you pointed out, we're not just talking about like the grassroots or the, you know, the, the militia hills as might have been talked about like during the Clinton nineties or something like that. And remember how much was made of, of, of that in the run up into the, into the, in the deep political run up to the new quote unquote American century in nine 11 with things like the first, uh, you know, the, the first WTC bombing, but then Oklahoma city and this really strong, focus then on the threat of domestic uh, terrorism, domestic extremism. Now that 
sort of element that even just thinking about it as a a concept or a a counter gang counter boogie gang even let's say counter boogie boy or <laughs> boogaloo boy <laughs> kind of scenario where it can just basically be pointed at uh in these coming years that it cr- it creates a um, a massive possibility for i would call it like it's almost like a uh, uh, you know dispersed uh dig- uh hybrid warfare tactical nu- nukes in an information warfare kind of scenario and that's why people who are in full denial about how foreign this was or this is as you pointed out on C-SPAN and all of its elements and how it's fused with these domestic elements and you know how how russian this this was how israeli this was people who are in denial in, in, of any of those elements don't really understand how potentially dangerous this exister, existing uh, hybrid uh, shock troop set really potentially is especially then when you layer on top of it just as you said this is like you know not reserved to uh you know, to uh, shortwave radio, you know, this is, this is the commanding heights of right of like corporate right wing radio. This is now at the commanding heights of the Pentagon. Uh, this is the commanding heights of, of generals who are saying this kind of stuff out loud, who are part and parcel of this ongoing threat in many ways. Right. And so that, that's gonna, that's continues. And so no matter what happens in the next, month and a half here uh, or through the rest of the quote unquote dark winter to darkest winter or whatever. And how we move out of that and how we then address what comes after that, there's going to be this political situation here. And that's totally uh, not even dealing with what then the, those that are now coming into executive branch power (laughs) represent in terms of, the dangers. <laughs> All right, so I guess we'll uh, wrap this wrap this uh, recording up with a um, with talking about the incoming um, administration, particularly the some of the picks from uh, the foreign policy picks, foreign policy side of things, and um, and let's just deal. Let's just deal ahead, with, let's, with, let's just deal with Blinken. Yes, let's deal. Yes, let's get to it. and that's it. But we, he can be a sort of touch point for what is represented, I think. And I think it's totally Agreed. fair because his group, uh, this West exec, uh, consulting company that he started with, uh, Michelle Flournoy, that includes a whole set of people, including Dennis Ross. And it's interesting. Dennis, <laughs> Dennis Ross is identified as the, the, Mole, the neocon mole in the Obama one administration, which mis- makes total sense when you look at the incoming. Even people. even uh, Aaron David Miller, who is not um, who is not anti-Israel by any stretch of imagination, basically basically publicly said Dennis Ross is uh, an agent for Israel. So. Or he didn't say an agent. He said that he acted as Israel's lawyer, I think, is sort of Israel's lawyer, yeah. which is well, which is acting as Israel's agent. <laughs> But he did, he didn't necessarily say it at that close. Yeah, I understand yeah. that. Yeah, no. I, I should be. I agree with you. I agree. You're right. You're right. No, but in, in, in general, you're right. And they like and and the closeness. I would just say the closeness of Dennis Ross to the Mikulskis, very close to the Mikulskis, suggests a very close relationship to those who, such as a Michael Mikulski. Who have apparently been identified by, uh, you know, the U.S. intelligence community as verified you, uh, in, in, uh, agents of, of, of a foreign government, Israel. Okay. All right. So there is that. And, and so Dennis Ross is part of this Blinken set West exec, uh, uh, group. And, and, uh, and I think the, you know, I think a lot can be surmised from the way that they did their announcement and what Blinken said when they, when Biden handed it over to him and uh, Blinken told a story about his uh, stepfather, I believe it was. uh, And he didn't name him, but he was, it's, and, and the, 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 the architecture here is very much in line with what the marketing behind uh, Obama Harris is, which is very, 
restoring Amer- Americana ideals and Americana stories and c- people who come up through difficulty and immigrants who make it good and make it big and, and competency and we're back, we're going to build back better. And then layered on top of all of that is a sort of in- pseudo institutionalized wokeness uh, sort of super identity politics almost used as like human shields in a way to defend against criticism. And we're going to, it's going to look like America, but is it going to be representative of America? No, it's just going to look like America is basically what it's, what it seems like is the, the sort of the surface presentation of, uh, of their, of their marketing here. But meanwhile, it's, you know, the national security set here is, Blinken and Blinken's Flournoy West exec set, uh, where they are working with foreign companies. They are, they apparently work with this, uh, what they call an Israeli artificial intelligence company, but it looks like it's a parallel or a competitor to, uh, Ghislaine Maxwell's boyfriend slash maybe husband, pseudo husband of some sort, Scott Borgerson that we covered, uh, uh, after Maxwell was, um, Arrested, I think. Oh no, actually we covered that before she was arrested. Um, that cargo metrics, right? Uh, artificial intelligence applied to big data analysis of shipping, of global shipping. And so this, uh, company that, uh, Blinken and crew, uh, represented via West Exec is, uh, let's see, what's the company? What's the name of that company? I can't remember. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Greg. Oh, and uh, oh, and David David Cohen, who's the uh, the deputy director, the former deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency from 2015 to 2017, he got the uh, the nickname of the Sanctions Guru at at Treasury. Uh, very crucial to the post 9 11 uh, era. Um, he's part of the West Exec. Crew and the and the 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 name the name is basically about the that they are highly seasoned veterans of the executive branch and the White House and they uh you know cross that um street there uh next to the White House many many times basically West Exec uh and <laughs> so that's the, that's the naming uh of it and. The, and it's what's interesting too is they are one of their strategic partners is the Boston Consulting Group, right? Which is parallel, parallel to the background of Baines, uh, and, and all, and all of that. Um, I'm trying to get the name of this Israeli company, but I, I can't find it right now. It's all right. Um, in a moment I could look for it here. I'll find it here in a minute. Okay. I'll just keep going. I, w- I want to go back to this m- announcement of Blinken that really points to puts the whole sort of network in many ways together, right? So as they are announcing, you know, uh, there's going to be a, a, a woman who's going to head n- national intelligence. There's going to be a uh, African American woman. There's going to be a uh, Mexican American, I think, or maybe a Cuban American in charge of homeland security, and a lot of uh, Jewish Zionists all around too. So it's <laughs> going on here too. But Blinken himself tells the story of his uh, father-in-law uh, or stepfather. And this very Americana story, you know, of he, he escaped a concentration camp at the end of World War II in the European theater and he ran into the woods or something like that. And then he was just waiting there all alone as maybe as a boy or young or something like that. And he, then he saw this just beautiful image of the American soldiers coming up the road and they, they saved him, you know, and, and, uh, and then he basically, and, and then I became, you know, now here I am with just being in so well entrusted by you, uh, president elect Biden. And meanwhile, he never identifies who that stepfather is. And the stepfather's name is Samuel Pissar, who turns out to be the longtime lawyer and confident of Robert Maxwell, the father of Ghislaine Maxwell, 
the Israel super spy. And, and apparently the guy who was the last person to speak to Robert Maxwell, apparently alive. So there's a lot of stuff loaded in there with that, that all being that whole background there of a Maxwell's wingman with a daughter now in prison, apparently being, uh, there's still no, almost no talk at a law at a high level in terms of that. This was some kind of Israeli intelligence blackmail operation Epstein and Maxwell. There's the whole even deeper, darker background of the background in terms of the promise software and Israel as a cutout in many ways and Maxwell's relationship to the Soviet sphere even and the Maxwell sons working with the, uh, the Mogilevich set really, uh, in terms of, uh, financial instruments and relationship to Moving money into the Israeli political sphere, the Natan, that whole Natan Sharansky, uh, Red Mafia question in the background there. But then meanwhile, also, it turns out that his, by bi- Blinken's biological father, his name's Donald Blinken. He doesn't mention him. Donald Meyer Blinken is a leader in the fields of investment banking, education and arts patronage. Right. Remember, remember the whole thing about the uh, generations of the the money and the washing of the money and turn where it eventually just goes from, uh, you know, go, it goes from sort of black economics into uh, mob, uh, into uh, um, into financial uh, arenas and then into it's just all about philanthropy. Right. OK, so uh, that, that's a parallel, but I'm just saying it's similar. OK, so. Blinken's biological father, he was a director and one of the founders of E.M. Warburg Pincus and Company, an investment bank in New York, was the board chairman of the State University of New York from 1978 to 1990, an American ambassador to Hungary from 1994 to 1998. And there's some background on Hungary that we'll get into in the future that um, that's interesting around even around this question of drugs, pharmaceuticals. Opiates, Tiva Pharmaceuticals, Israeli Israeli uh, Pharmaceuticals uh, Company, the question of bio, uh, biological warfare, I would say, and the epicenter of Tiva Pharmaceuticals in Hungary, by the way. And by the way, I think it was even maybe even during the early years of Trump administration that the Hungarian ambassador to the United States was a former Tiva pharmaceutical executive. All right. There's a whole bunch of stuff in the background there that we'll get into the, get, get to in the future. But I would just say this locus of Hungary, 1994 to 1998, go read uh, Budapest Bridge, you know, those series of articles and, and think back, go to the background of all of that. Right. Um, so I think there's something, I think there's something there. But then just think about E.M. Warburg Pincus and Company, uh, that he didn't, you know, that, 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 uh, that, that, uh, Blinken basically does this whole thing about his stepfather coming in from, uh, Europe after World War II and that whole, you know, the beauty of the American military saving this, this boy. And then meanwhile, but the biological father is already in New York setting up, uh, you know, setting up the what becomes the lineage of people like Tim Geithner. But you just think about Warburg, right? He's I think he sets this up with uh, the son of, uh, yeah, Eric, Eric Warburg. In 1939, this is Warburg Pincus, the Blinken's father set this up. In 1939, Eric Warburg of the Warburg banking family founded a company under the name E.M. Warburg and Company. Its first address was 52 William Street, New York, the Kuhn Lo building. Um, the then, uh, all right. So there's all that. We can go into that. It's, you know, all around the world, Europe, India, China, Warburg, big. That's one of the, probably the most major global banking families in terms of like, if you want to get into the background of all of the spheres, if you want to talk about the American Federal Reserve, you want to talk about, uh, Germany, you want to talk about Russia, the Soviet Union. So this is, look at that. in many ways, and, in- continuity of the um of the of one of the bastions so to speak of the i guess of what you might call an aspect of conspiracy culture is very much focused on 
the bankers, so to speak, the Federal Reserve, but that there's a very serious, um, very serious strong element of truth and serious inquiry to outside of the way, like a name such as Warburg is obviously weaponized in many ways, shapes and forms. But this is a continuity of that with a very, very, very strong um, Israeli component to it that's going to be that's going to have a very, very serious effect on in terms of of our not just in terms of our domestic economic policy, but in terms of the direction of you know U.S. foreign policy, global policy is going to be headed. Yes, and it, it and we'll, I think we'll we'll continue exploring that aspect. But I, that's my immediate sense of what this really represents: is it's it's not the what some people are are still in denial about about the very Russian aspect to the Trump administration, Trump regime, whatever you want to call it. That that's on that looks like it might be on its way out. It hasn't admitted it yet, but and it's still running slop ops, and maybe there's something worse immediately. But I sort of have the sense, right? So what's coming back in is something what we might call the paleo neocons, which which we you know came up with that concept to clarify what the heck was going. Who were these neocons that were against Donald Trump from the beginning or from before? And uh, and how were they different from this other set of what could be called neocons that were fully riding the Trump horse to some other kind of goal? And so what we see here is the older school, maybe the paleo neocon, you know, American neoliberal establishment, foreign policy consensus types back in the saddle, potentially. And they are, you know, they can be pointed to as have being much more, you know experienced and much more uh effective and more uh american in their institutional outlook and a lot of that is true and at the same time as the, there is an engagement with into this next you know generation of global conflict so called right uh past the global war on terror one now into this great power uh, conflict. This is this is now. I think the the emphasis on the question of the American establishment and its relationship specifically with Israel and the background. This is partially why I was talking a lot about the origins of the Iraq War. This is going to come immediately back into focus, and we need to really bring it back and put it on the table. And of course, 9-11 needs to then again be put firmly back on the table. And, you know, this, this is one of the proper serious criticisms of the whole Biden set from everyone from the, you know, good faith, uh, Trump voters to the, to the left and the Bernie supporters and all that is the question of the Iraq war. Blinken was deeply in the mix in relationship uh, to the, to then Senator Biden and his his backing of the Iraq War, and so this is going to need to be uh, unpacked, and especially in this really global relationship of uh, of uh, you know China, especially Israel China, the U.S. Israel China, and then what kind of proposal is there that could be said to be beyond this pseudo dialectic? of different sort of flavors of neocons really at some level, you know, and there is one and it, and, and it's, it, it's also, uh, embraces the, the possibility of American Renaissance of even what you might say, American global leadership, but it has nothing to do with the question of, Either of the return in many ways. And I think what they're actually what they're looking to they're hoping to do here is like, oh, let's just forget about that whole like Iraq war, you know, biggest quote unquote blunder. You meant we did a whole show about when it came out about the blunder. It was not a blunder. It was a mass. It was one of the biggest, if not the biggest sort of crimes against humanity in this yeah. century, the Iraq war. And and it was also a geostrategic quote unquote error of massive proportions from the American imperial perspective, even. 
And it was not a blunder because because that's why we have to deal again with the nuts and bolts of the Israel lobby, <laughs> the book, the whole scenario, and then add on top of that the question of technology transfer, cyber, Talpiot, inserts, Hugent inserts, the combination of human intelligence and SIGINT into the, the heart of Silicon Valley. We, you know, also already saw this question of the Jedi cloud being tra- transferred in a very strange way by the Trump, uh, regime to the, uh, to Microsoft, uh, Adalome, Paul Piot, Unit 8200. So that is all going to be like immediately on the table in relationship to this moment that I believe they are going to try to recreate of no, no, for real. This is real. No, we messed up for the first fifth of the new American century, but let's hold, let's forget about the whole endless war and the Iraq war blunder and the stumble and the, you know, the 20 years of millions of, dis- you know, of lives destroyed and the, the <laughs> looting and plundering of the American resources and American morality and credibility on top of all of that. And let's really, let's really do it. Let's make this the real, uh, American uh, unipolar moment. And, and it's going to be done under the guise of a multipolar architecture, but that will be seen as the United States recreating a, a new global, uh, you know, um, alliance of some sort that, uh, and it'll, you know, it'll be, it'll be India in relationship to the pivot to Asia, you know, to the, the, the pivot to, uh, uh China. Oh. And it's all, it's going to be Japan, Australia, India, and they're going to assemble this. That's going to be the mul- the new mul- multipolar order that's going to try to extend the, uh, under the, it's, that's going to be the guise under which the American unipolar moment is going to be attempted to be, uh, extended. And meanwhile, I think we need to propose these, the kinds of things that we're being looked at by you know, the, the era of the Khrushchevs and the Kennedys where there are much bigger issues facing humanity beyond which nation state is going to dominate the other's sphere. And sure, we, I don't think we want to, you know, we do, we don't want to shy away from the question of China, but we also don't want to shy away from the question of the threat of the American uh, yeah. sort of surveillance state unipolar moment to be led by Eric Schmidt and Google <laughs> who are being brought into uh, this uh, this uh, administration. I'll give them a little chance this Biden administration before I call them regime. We'll see. We'll see how long uh, um, that lasts. And following up on what you said there regarding the um, it made me think when you talked about like this new push for like forget about the mistakes of the past we're really seriously going to do the right thing this time and i was thinking about that because it's an interesting dynamic that i think you might see a serious concerted um propaganda effort to promote within aspects of you know the media the you know democratic uh, more liberal establishment the combination of like the you know, the neoliberals and the paleoconservatives, right? Those who are like the, what we've come to coin the phrase of the paleoconservatives and their respective. The paleoconservatives. Right? Paleoneocons, I'm sorry. Yes, paleoconservatives, yes. Uh, and their respective, you know, mouthpieces in media and in other areas of our society. I think we could very well see like a prolonged propaganda effort where it'll be almost like a reversal of, um, it'll be kind of what you saw with, Obama in the aftermath of Bush, but even more pronounced now with the aftermath of Donald Trump. And that is a scenario where you go from the Americans being obviously just how hate despised and disliked the U.S. was around the globe because of the criminality of the Bush administration, right? Obviously, there was still crimes taking place under the Obama administration, but it was a pronounced um, drawing down of like the overt blatant uh, war crimes of the Bush era. And then with Trump, you know, until, you, until it was escalated under Obama. Well, but, but you're mean, right though, in terms of the front end of it is yeah. the, oh no, we're going to, we're going to draw down. We're going to be more humble. We're going to be more respectable and respectful. Right. And then the whole thing escalates into sort of drone legal architectures and Libya. 
Yeah, but I mean, from that regard, like the way the way the, I think the the perception of the Obama administration was it was less openly like criminal in terms of its carrying out of things as far as compared to yeah. the ugliness of the Bush administration. I mean, you're right, but I'm uh, uh, the perceptions what I'm uh, going by. And uh-huh. then you know you have Trump that comes in, and Trump just like completely destroys. Um, going back to that conversation of norms, right? You know, the norms of both. Domestically and globally in America, you know, the U.S. is the enemy. again. So I think you just see a prolonged campaign to now that Biden's in once now that the Democrats are in and, and Trump is gone. America is the good guy in the world again, and the world can trust American global leadership again to do the right things, which goes right in with regards to the forget the forget the mistakes we made in the past. We're beyond that now. But with Trump gone, post Trump, the world can trust the Americans to do the right thing again. I think you're going to see a strong propaganda push for that here in the next few years. I think you're, I think you're completely right. And, and this is all like putting aside the question that we dealt with before about the, the, and this of, this was, you know, this Avril Haynes, uh, selection suggests that this is once again the Obama, uh, Bush era, as you identify that, that there is a sort of, at least for the aspects of the world who are looking for what looks to be a bit saner presenting a little less criminal presenting leadership um and as that's happening then there's all the look forward not backwards and so the Avril Haynes being apparently being a leader in making sure there was not either uh transparency or accountability in relationship to the Bush era CIA torture crimes Right. And actually, and then we pointed this out very early, actually, in in during the Trump era. And, and maybe we actually did it during our show. We did a show about Obama and Obama's relationship a lot with uh, Israel and Zionism. And what's interesting now, but Obama has his new book. We'll talk more about Obama in, in the future, I think. But he has his new book out where he discusses pretty openly, you know, the the uh, power, the Israel lobby power in relation and Netanyahu and all of all of that and, uh, and discussing it, you know, way too late, really, in terms of having having some public discourse serious effect when it would have mattered, which is when it was happening, bro. You know, uh, and so, you know, the, there is that aspect where they decided Avril Haynes and this whole Obama thing that in so doing to try to look forward rather than backwards, they actually set up not only the situation where they escalated a torture program into a, 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 a not only a physically escalated but a legally escalated drone program which Avril Haynes did a lot of the legal architecture for and I believe she actually was as legally careful as they say that she was in architecting it however what it did was it it, it just escalated the machinery of death and instead of you know Obama saying that he had black sites and uh, was filling up Guantanamo again. He basically solved that problem politically by uh, incinerating people at weddings uh, and uh, and killing uh, children, right? And 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 now what? And 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 this should be really hung around the neck of like this whole crew and this uh, the Obama crew is now under a, a, someone like a Trump. It's been escalated, but we have no actually no clue how much it's been escalated. We have a sense it's been escalated severely, actually. But there's because it's in a it's been even made even more covert in many ways. Uh, and so we've heard less and less about it so that even like people who see should know a lot better are still calling Trump some kind of, uh, you know, anti-war president when he took the Obama administration legal architecture for the drone program that killed you know, they say you know high hundreds but it was thousands very likely uh and they've escalated that uh under trump and now these quote-unquote legal architecture of it is probably like okay all right just to do it you know i mean there's probably there's probably very little legal quote-unquote architecture behind the escalation 
of the terror war drone program. And so that is a lot of this, the danger of this moment. And I think, and that's where I, you know, my, my sense of it is that the early look forward, not backwards scenario in Obama administration led to the violent escalations uh, in relationship to uh, around the world and, you know, Libya and Syria uh, and Yemen and, 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 and all of that. And I think perhaps the beginning to close it up here, that is why you cannot allow history to repeat itself and just let the let the last few years and obviously even everything even going back before that, you know, much less why we can't do it why we cannot afford to have another moment like when Obama came into office and the past was completely forgotten about and just swept under the rug because the more and more of this continues to happen. It's, it's, it's a guarantee at this point that if the crimes and the, all of the, everything regarding everything that's going on in this country right now of the 2016 operation of everything that happened before that and since is not dealt with and honestly addressed in a very serious manner that ensures that, uh, you know, that there are aspects of justice that are served, but also serious conversations about how cannot happen again then it is destined and doomed to repeat itself and when it does come back when you do have whatever the next step is after trump of this operation it's guaranteed to come back and history by all indications it's almost guaranteed to be it it's a very strong chance that it'll come back and be even worse than it is right now so it is absolutely imperative to not sweep the make the past the past and instead deal with it head on and in a very serious in a very very serious manner and that's an understatement but yeah not dealing with it is going to guarantee that it continues on and that it rears its ugly head in a very very bad way uh it's probably sooner than later and that the the what's nor quote unquote normalized is highly criminal it, and it needs to, and that is one of the very likely one of the motivators behind the perpetual lack of accountability at the highest levels in our society. Obviously, just the Maxwell question, the Epstein question is so relevant at this point. The combination of the question of the Iraq war, of Israeli intelligence's involvement and in all of that, the question of leverage. That has still not been explained in relationship to that or the 2004 election mid Iraq war where Kerry then skull and bones Kerry said nothing, uh, in the midst of election fraud. You know, I mean, so all of that is just can is a mass criminality. And then you factor in that this is the cyber age and that is the Maxwell Epstein network. From Epstein's work at MIT, right? His investments in, in people at MIT, the close knit relationship to Silicon Valley, to scientists, to Maxwell and her, the sister, the Maxwell sisters, deep involvement in real core cyber technology, uh, post 9-11 stuff incorporated into the FBI, uh, Israeli intelligence investment. Vehicles, deep, uh, Isabel, I believe, Maxwell relationship with, uh, with Microsoft and Bill Gates. Uh, and I mean, so that is so, that's a crucial thing to hold, uh, in focus right now, I think. And so this, this now linkage to, of Blinken to Robert Maxwell, familial linkage to Robert Maxwell is crucial. I think to focus on not just as a singular fact, but as representative of this quote unquote normalized corrupt establishment. Um, and, and also I agree too that there needs to be a focus in the moment on not allowing it to be forgotten what just was done criminally. And that of course is the question of accountability immediately in relationship to uh, the 11 9 uh, global mob Trump operation, uh, it, it, right immediately after the last bits of its fits of uh, Trump pump and dump slop ops on their way out. Okay. So at the same time, 
you know, Flournoy, Blinken, this whole set here that's being set set up here uh, needs to be looked at very, very carefully. And we need to further expand the awareness and understanding specifically of this very, very dark relationship between uh, the U.S. and Israel and the power dynamics that uh, underlie uh, a, a lot of that. And the question of whether we are going to engage in the crisis of our, we have crises of our moment that are severe and uh, require very quick action at a very large scale or scaled up, let's say. We can do it on a, a localized but scaled up up through state, national, international levels in terms of a combination of economy, ecology, and technology, and major decisions about the future of our country, about the future of humanity, about the future of our humanness are going to be made in this coming decade, really. And so we need to be up to the that challenge in, in the time scheme that we need to be up to it and uh, make sure that 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 the answers to those challenges are being met with a question of morality, political sovereignty of we the people, and then spiritual uh, dignity fully in the mix. And that's only going to happen if we, the people, and I don't mean just here in we, the people in the, the Republic of the United States of America, but we, the people worldwide, whether we are, uh, you know, get our act together in time. So I appreciate right. our conversation, Greg. Yep. And I think this is a perfect, a perfect point to finish this conversation for now. And, uh, and thank you for, thank you. Thank you as always for, for doing this and, uh, we'll be back very soon where, uh, definitely talking about, uh, more of the events of our moment. But, uh, you know, while I'll just wrap up by saying that while there's, uh, always reasons for pessimism and there's also reasons for optimism, particularly like right now, like there's a great opportunity for some serious, uh, I think, you know, we always talk about this, but right now in this moment, I think with the, we're heading into the after, we're heading into barring some type of catas, ridiculous, uh, unforeseen events, you know, uh, you know, um, outside of that, we're heading into a post Trump era. And I think a lot of people are ready for conversations and they're very serious, uh, people as far as like even reaching out to aspects, jilted aspects of the, Trump base you see that none of these promises are coming to fruition combined with a combination of uh, very serious astute observers of the Trump era and also elements of the uh, you know the democratic base that are very disenchanted with uh, the prospects of what a Biden Harris administration is going to bring it's a very interesting time to be I think to really uh, have dialogue with uh, with people about the events of our time and I think there's a there's a we say this all the time. But I think right now there's a really big, there are a lot of really big openings in that, with that regard. So that's a that's a reason to be optimistic in this moment. Yeah, or at least hopeful. Hopeful, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Well, uh, thank you, my friend, and we'll uh, we'll do we'll do this again very soon. All right. Thank you, Greg, my friend. All right. Bye, y'all. Antidote, we out. Uh-huh.